dear students in the previous lecture we have discussed about conflicts in this lecture we are going to discuss about negotiation this is the phase 1 in the project initiation stage this is to recollect you that currently last class we discussed about the conflict now we are discussing about negotiation the agenda for this lecture is nature of negotiation then lateral relations some requirement for negotiation then what is called the principled negotiation then very important aspect ethics in negotiation then partnering chartering and scope change these are the agenda for this lecture first we will discuss about nature of negotiation there are a variety of approaches for dealing with conflict generally speaking the favored technique for resolving conflict is negotiation this lecture has a direct connection with the previous lecture previous lecture i discussed about conflicts now to resolve that conflict one of the important technique is called negotiation so negotiation is the field of knowledge and endeavor that focuses on gaining the favor of people from whom we want things there are other names for negotiation in literature some people call it mediate make peace bring to agreement settle differences moderate arbitrate compromise bargain these are other names for negotiation most of the conflicts that involve the organization and outsiders have to do with property right and contractual obligations so the core reason most of the time the core reason for conflict is there is a dispute with the property rights and contract obligations because some people may not follow the contract as per the agreement some people may claim the right for the property both people will claim that their own right then that lead to conflict so in these cases the parties to negotiation see themselves as opponents so the parties who are involved in the negotiation always they see the other party as an enemy or opponents conflict arising inside the organization may also appear to involve property rights and obligations but they typically differ from conflict with outsiders as far as the firm is concerned they are conflict between allies not opponents so in the project context the conflict arises only between allies friends not opponents organization like groups consist of interdependent parts that have their own values interest perceptions and goals each unit seeks to fulfill its particular goal and the effectiveness of the organization depends on the success of each unit's fulfillment of its specialized task since each unit wants to fulfill their own goal that lead to conflicts so we need to talk about negotiation here one of the way to solve the conflict is called lateral relations in which organizations facilitate this integration is to establish lateral relations which allow decision to be made horizontally across lines of authority there is no hierarchical there is no vertical decisions now we are making a horizontal decision so a lateral relationship in management is a link between two employee of the same organization who are at the same level of authority so when we discuss the people who are involved in the same level of authority that will reduce the conflicts that is called lateral relations as each unit will have its own goals integrating the activities of two or more unit is certain to produce the conflict that should not take place the conflicts may however be resolved by negotiating a solution if one exists that produces gains for all parties or minimizes the loss to 
the best strategy to resolve the conflict is we have to make a decision that is called a negotiation that will provide gain for all the parties or minimize the losses for all the parties. Now, we will discuss about nature of negotiation. The proper outcome of negotiation should be to optimize the outcome in terms of overall organization goals. Although it is not always obvious how to do this, negotiation is clearly the correct approach. Some requirement of negotiation. Few conflicts have to do with whether or not a task will be undertaken. Some people say we have to take this task, some people will say we should not take the task that lead to conflict. Instead, they have to do with the design of the deliverable like how we are going to deliver, whom we are going to deliver, when we are going to deliver, at what cost we are going to deliver. When we understand this, then the conflict will be reduced. So, the work of the project should get done, if not everyone losses. So, the ultimate aim of the organization is the project has to be done, the project has to be completed. Everybody feel should feel that the project is ultimate purpose. So, if they understand that the completion of the project is more important, otherwise it is a loss for everyone, then there would not be much conflict. One requirement for the conflict reduction or resolution method used by the project manager is that they must allow the conflict to be settled without irreparable harm to the project's objectives. So, when we take a solution for the conflicts, we have to suggest a solution without irreparable harm to the project's objectives. The project is more important. A second requirement is they allow or foster honesty between the negotiation. So, when you go for the negotiation, the honesty is more important. The first task is project is important, the second point is that the honesty is more important. The third requirement of all conflicting parties is to seek solutions to conflict that not only satisfy their own individual needs, but also satisfy the needs of other parties to the conflict as well as the needs of the parent organization. Here we have to satisfy your own need, at the same time you have to satisfy the needs of others and you have to satisfy the needs of the parent organization. These are the three important requirements for negotiation. Now, we will talk about the principled negotiation. So, some of the principles are separate the people from the problem, do not carry the people's image onto the problem, because you separated problem is different, the people is different. Then focus on interest, not the positions. Here the interest is the project should be successful, whether who is saying that, that is not important. The third principle is before trying to reach agreement, invent options for mutual gain. So, before you go to the negotiation table, you should have various options in your hand that need to be discussed with other parties. Insist on using objective criteria, that is when you make a criteria for resolving the conflicts, you make it objective criteria. If there is any subjectivity, there is a chance that people will interpret in different way. So, that is why the fourth principle is insist on using objective criteria. The another point is ethics in negotiation, it is very important when you go for negotiation. So, during the negotiation process, an ethical situation often arises that is worth noting. Consider the situation where a firm requests an outside contractors to develop a software package to achieve some function. When the firm asks for a specific objective to be accomplished, it frequently does not know if that is a major or a trivial task as it lacks technical competence in that area. So, the contractor has the opportunity to misrepresent the task to its consumer, either inflating the cost for a trivial task or minimizing the impact of 
a significant task in order to acquire the contract and later boosting the cost. Here, the nature of the task may not be known to the, the other party, he may not be technically sound. So, you should not inflate the cost of the project just because of that other person is not aware that. So, we need to have the ethics whether the task is genuinely a simple task or complicated task, complex task. Based on that, you should go, you should go for casting. The ethics of a situation require that each party in the negotiation be harnessed with one another, even in situations where it is clear that there will not be further work between the two. So, with the other party, you may not have further task or further work to do with other party, but still you have to maintain the honesty. Now, we will discuss about partnering, chartering and scope change. Three situations commonly arising during the project that call for highest level of negotiation skill the project manager can muster is the use of subcontractors. So, whenever you use subcontractors, you need to have the skill of negotiation because you have to negotiate with your suppliers in terms of cost, in terms of quality, in terms of delivery schedule, there the concept of negotiation is required. The second requirement where you need to have the negotiation skill is the use of input from two or more functional units to design and develop the project's mission. Suppose you are getting input from two, three peoples. So, you need to have the skill of negotiation because some people may not supply the input at the right time. So, you need the support of each people, there you need to have the negotiation skill. The third one is the management of changes ordered in the project's deliverables and our priorities after the project is underway. See, the project is started but the management is asking some changes. So, you have to convince, you have to negotiate your team members or you have to negotiate the project sponsor itself that they cannot do or they can do about these new changes. So, here also there is a need for negotiation skill. First, we will talk about the first way, the first technique for negotiation is partnering. In recent years, there has been a steady growth in the frequency of outsourcing parts of the project. So, external suppliers increasingly are delivering the parts of the projects including tangible products and services as well as intangible knowledge and skills. So, when you buy something from the outside, when you outsource it, so you need to have the uh, partnering, you have to have a good relationship with the other party. There are many reasons beyond avoidance of litigation that the firms enter partnering arrangement with each other, having a collaboration or coordination with other person that is called partnering. For example, diversification of technical risk. So, when you have your partnering, you can diversify your technical risk because the other party, a person who is expert in technical knowledge, so you are, you, you are completely relying on the other person so that your risk is reduced. Then avoidance of capital investment, when you have your partnering that other party may have already capital, already may have the infrastructure. So, you need not go for any capital investment, that is the advantage of partnering. Then reducing political risk on multinational projects, if you have a collaboration with other countries, if you have your partnering, you can avoid political risk. Then shortening the duration of the project. When you have a collaboration or when you have a partnering with others, there is a more chance that the project duration can be reduced. The another benefit is pooling the complementary knowledge among them. This is a very important point. When you have a partnership collaboration with others, each person may have their own competency. So, when you bring it together, then there is a chance that synergy will occur. So, that there will be a complementary knowledge can be shared with the other collaborator or partner, so that the quality of the project will be improved. Traditionally, relations between the organizations carrying out a project and a subcontractor working on the project are best characterized as adversarial. 
many times the relationship between the project owner and the not the project owner the project and subcontractors will not be good. So, the project people may say that this subcontractor is delivering product which is not good quality they are not that subcontractor is not delivering at the right time. So, the relationship will not be good. So, the parent organization's objective is to get the deliverable at the lowest possible cost as soon as possible. This is possible only if you have a partnering with your supplier or other member. The subcontractor's objective is to produce the deliverable at the highest possible profit with the least effort. Now, here the conflict comes. So, the project people want things to be done at the lowest cost, but the subcontractor aim is that he has to earn profit. So, these conflicting interests tend to lead both the parties to work in a atmosphere of mutual suspicion and antagonism. So, there is a suspicion on their relationship, everybody thinks that the other person is enemy. Indeed, it is almost axiomatic that the two parties will have significantly different ideas about the exact nature of the deliverables. Deliverable is same, but both the parties will have different ideas. So, that lead to conflict, that conflict can be minimized if you have a partnering with your collaborator. So, project partnering is a method of transforming contractual relationship into a cohesive cooperative project team with a single set of goals and established procedures for resolving dispute in a timely and effectively manner. This is the definition of partnering. So, here we are moving from contractual relationship to cohesive and cooperative relationship. So, contractual relationship what will happen that the relationship between both the parties will not be good. So, when you have the partnering there is a chance there is a you can easily achieve cohesive and cooperative project. Now, we will discuss about multi step process for building partnered projects. So, how to have the partnership otherwise how to do partnered project. First the parent firm must make a commitment to partnering select subcontractors who will also make such a commitment engage in joint team building exercise and develop a charter of the project. The first point is there should be a support from the parent organization, they need a commitment to the partner and they need a support from selecting subcontractors. So, when there is a good support from the parent organization then we can that is the first step then we can go for partnering. So, the second step is both the parties must implement a partnering process with a four part agreement on. So, both the parties who are willing to have the partnership the they should follow these four important point. First point is they should have a joint evaluation of the project's progress. Both the parties should sit together in the evaluation meeting. And the second one is a method for resolving any problems and disagreements. So, they need to have a, a procedure for resolving the problems in case if any disagreements occurs between two parties. Third principle is acceptance of a goal for a continuous improvement for the joint project. So, every parties should think that they will similar to our total quality management every partners in the every party should work together for continuous improvement. So, continuous support for the process of partnering from senior management of both the parties. So, we have to have a support continuous support from both the senior management of the partners. Finally, the parties commit to a joint review of project execution when the project is completed. Each step in this process must be accompanied by negotiation and the negotiation must be non-adversarial. That means, there should be a win-win situation between two parties who are involved in the negotiation. 
the entire concept is firmly rooted in the assumption of mutual trust between the partners and this assumption too requires non-adversarial negotiation. So, very important enabler for good relationship with the partner is trusting each other. If there is a lack of trust between the two parties, then it is very difficult to achieve good relationship in partnering. So far we discussed about partnering between two parties. Now we will discuss about partnering, partnering beyond two parties. The concept of partnering however, goes for beyond two party agreements between buyer and seller or interdepartmental cooperation on a project. The use of a multi party consortia to pursue a technological research objective is common. Suppose somebody is working on a particular technology, there may be more than two people will work as a consortium, a group of people will work for achieving the technology. There are a great many such groups of competitors engaged in cooperative research and other cooperative activities. They exist worldwide and are often multinational in their membership. For example, Airbus industry originally British, French, Spanish and German and the international aero engines originally in the US, and Japan, Germany, Italy and the UK, they have the partnerships. It is not between one countries, there are multiple countries working on the same project, research and development project. Airbus industry is not only a consortium of private firms from four different nations, but each of the four government subsidized their respective private firms. This venture apparently undertaken in order to foster a European competitor to the United States Boeing aircraft resulted in a successful competitor in a market for commercial aircraft. Now, we will discuss about what are the problems in partnering. There can be no doubt that those who have not had must, much experience with the partnering underrate its difficulty. So, partnering requires strong support from senior management of all participants and it requires continuous support of project objectives and partnering agreements. Above all, the most difficult of all it requires open and honest communication between the partners. Previously, we discussed about the importance of trust. So, to achieve that import the trust, the first enabler is sharing the information, having a good communication with other parties. With all of its problems, however, partnering yields benefit great enough to be worth the effort required to make it work correctly. The next methodology is called chartering. So far we studied about partnering that is one of the way to have the negotiation. Now, we will discuss about chartering. A project or program, charter is a detailed written agreement between the stakeholders in the project. That is the client or sponsor, the project manager and the senior management, the functional managers who are committing resources and or people to a specific project and even possibly others such as community groups or environmental entities. Here the chartering is, it is a written agreement between different parties who are involved for that work. Otherwise, if there is no written agreement, what will happen? There will be a different way of the expectation from others. Charter may take many different forms. Typically, it gives an overview of the project and details the expected deliverables including schedules, personal, resource commitment, risk and evaluation methods. So, chartering attest to the fact that all the stakeholders are on same page, agreeing about what is to be done, when it is to be done and what will be the cost. Note that if there is such an agreement, there is also an implication that none of the parties will change the agreement unilaterally or at least 
without prior consultation with the other stakeholders. That is why chartering is important. Many projects do not have charters, which is one reason that many projects do not meet their scope or not completed on time or not completed on budget. So, chartering is more important. Now, we will show you a, a sample charter. An informal project charter appears in Coven et al. in which the various members of the partnering team sign a commitment to meet design intent, to complete the contract without need for litigation, to finish project on schedule and to solve the issues on timely manner and managing joint schedule and to keep cost growth to less than 2 percentage. This is then a sample charter. Of course, to meet the underlying purpose of a charter, even these less specific terms assume an agreement on the design intent, the schedule and the cost. So far, we discussed about partnering and chartering. Now, we will discuss about scope change. The problem of changing the scope expected to a project is a major issue in project management and constitute part of the second project management body of knowledge area. No matter how carefully a project is planned, it is almost certain to be changed before completion. No matter how carefully defined at the start, the scope of most project is subject to considerable uncertainty. Now, we will discuss about three basic causes of changes in scope, changes in project. Some changes result because the planners erred in their initial assessment about how to achieve a given end or erred in their choice of proper goal for the project. Sometime what will happen? The reason for changing in the project is very wrongly providing the objectives without knowing the consequences. The second one is technological uncertainty is the fundamental cause factor for their error. Suppose that time when they are at the time of project proposal there may be one technology. Now, at the time of implementing the project there may be another technology. So, we need to have the change. So, the foundation for example, the foundation for a building must be changed because a preliminary geological study did not reveal a weakness in the structure of the ground on which the building will stand. So, now we have to have a because now there may be a new technology to see the weakness of the stand that says that it is not good enough this foundation is not enough. Now, we have to change the our requirement. Second one the project team becomes aware of recent innovation that allows a faster cheaper solution to the confirmation of a new computer. So, when there is a technological development, then we need to go for change the project objectives in fact. And the third source of change is the mandate. This is a change in the environment in which the project is being conducted. As such, it cannot be controlled by the project manager. Some of the reason for changing is a new law has passed, then we have to change the project objective. The government regulatory unit articulates a new policy, then we have to change the project. A trade association set a new standard, then we have to change the project. So, in this lecture, we discussed about nature of negotiation, then I talked about one way to resolve the conflict is having lateral relationship, that is a horizontal relationship with all the members at the same authority level. Then I discussed about some requirement for a negotiation then I discussed about the principled negotiation, then I discussed about ethics in negotiation, then I have discussed partnering, chartering and scope change. Thank you.